So everything that you see growing over here also exists in this seed bank over here. So what's the difference? Why do we see a lot more diversity over here and a lot less diversity over here? Okay, grazing. All right, but now, the, it, does the way that they graze across the landscape also matter in terms of what you see in diversity? Yeah. Okay. Now, if I were just beginning, and as we turn, made that turn and came down that road there, and we started opening up into these fields that are over here that haven't been grazed for a while, my immediate thought was, boy, I love this. Okay? All right? See, I would... So, your average producer, your average producer, what would they do with this before they decided to graze it? What would they do to it? Bush hog it and or spray it. Right? Okay? And they may even think, Oh my goodness, I gotta come in here and renovate this, right? And I gotta plant it, you know, I got I gotta disc it up and I gotta sow it and I gotta put it in some kind of hybrid cultivar, right? Well folks. Gotta make it look pretty. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It won't make this look pretty, right? This will be a whole lot thinner. So the deal is everything that the average producer thinks they got to do and guys full confession when i was with mississippi state university and i was an extension beef cattle specialist and all of that okay i would have said do the same thing go in here bush hog it spray it renovate it plant something you know some high performing cultivar all of that you know what i was dead wrong Okay, I was dead wrong. And I would have caused a producer to spend a whole heck of a lot of money that they didn't need to spend. See, this right here excites me because I can come into this with that amount of diversity that's in that seed bank right there. I can come into that right now and just start grazing it as it is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bush hog, I wouldn't do anything. I just fence the darn thing or even temporary fencing, mm -hmm. you know? Because here, with your cattle already here, all you need is a single strand of polywire. Guys around here to contain that you train them to polywire, and then they're good to go, right? So even the fencing is temporary and very, very inexpensive, right? So I would, this would excite me enormously because of that diversity that already exists. I could come in here and graze that under density, under adaptive grazing, and turn that into an incredibly productive area very, very cheaply with spending. The only thing I'm spending money on is my time to move those livestock through that and the single strand polywire and tread in post and an energizer. You know, initially I just come down, so I would I would go to the far side on the wood line there. Okay. Okay. And if I needed to, I would just mow me a path just big enough to put a single strand of poly wire along that fence line coming down this way. And then I would just walk them down this field, poly wire this way, okay? Because you already got your permanent fence right here, right? So this side's good to go. And so I would just walk them right down there. Now, one thing that you could do to make this more effective is you could come in and mow this one, this fence line on the inside, and then put offset brackets with a single strand of high tensile wire. Okay, and electrify that, and then that immediately feeds your poly wire. So everywhere that I hook my poly wire into right here, mm -hmm. it's automatically energized, right? And you can buy the things that you spend money on for a, for a livestock operation, okay? And young people, y'all listen to this because if you aspire to do any of this, this matters a whole lot, okay? in terms of making money, having a profitable business. Never spend money on things that don't make you money. Most farmers and ranchers make that mistake almost every day. They spend money on things that grow rust, rot, 
whatever, depreciate all of that, right? Folks spend money on things that make you money, okay? And, and listen, we all like a fancy tractor, we like a fancy truck, fancy equipment or whatever, but the thing is every bit of that rust and depreciates and costs you a lot of money, fuel, maintenance, repair, all of that. If I spend money on the <coughs> best materials you can for temporary fencing and things like that, so never skimp on your poly wire, never skimp on your tread in post, never skimp on your energizer. You want a high jewel energizer, J-O-U-L-E. That means they have a lot of power to it, okay? High jewel energizer, like a 30 joule plus, okay? And that will burn through all of that stuff there, guys. And I don't even have, as I come down this way, I don't even have to mow. All I have to do is use my ATV or UTV wheel tracks, right? And so I drive down through there and my wheel tracks become where I place my fence, all right? But one thing to note, so I'm gonna have two wheel tracks. And if I'm moving them this direction downhill, I'm gonna have two wheel tracks, this one and this one, the left and the right. So in which wheel track would I place my poly bar? Left or the right? Well, where do you count? Where are you count? Where do you start? In the right. Okay, why? Why, Walter? Exactly. So they, they encounter the first wheel track, right? And they say, oh, something's different. I need to look for something. Then they see the poly wire in the next one. Okay, but if you put the poly wire over here and all of this stuff is tall, they hit it and mash that wire down before they even know they're on it, right? So exactly right. Exactly right. So it's very important as you move down through here, you know, that you can set up these paddocks, you can set your water up here and not have to move water every day, all right? Put your, pad your water in your first paddock and for the next five to six days, walk them away from the water with each successive daily paddock, okay? Walk, and they can walk back across the previously grazed paddocks for water and then after five to six days, then move your water and start a new back fence. Now, why? Why five to six days? Grass regrows. Okay, exactly. Because the, after five to six days, the new grass starts to regrow with those tender young shoots. They'll start seeking them out and trying to regraze that. We don't want them to do that, right? <coughs> But why can I do that and not have to put a back fence up every day for five days? No growth. They're not interested in that previous... If I've got the density right, you've got a lot of trample, a lot of manure and urine applied, and we call that soiled ground. They're not interested in grazing that again for a while, are they? Okay? They, and if you're giving them a fresh bite every single day, that's what they're interested in. That's what they want. They want that fresh bite every day. So again, I got, I actually got excited when I was driving down through there and I saw these fields and I was like, man, I'd be grazing them. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, that, that's free, that's free money right there, folks. Okay, that's free money. I, I would be on them and by golly, I'd add other species of livestock if I could as well, you know, to would take you advantage of that. Would you, typically, uh, now, would you typically goat or sheep that before you brought the cattle in? You know, my, well, my cattle, we'd eat everything in there. Goldenrod, every, everything I saw in there, okay, they'd eat it. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of dog fennel, I saw mare's tail, a whole bunch of stuff. But if the cattle aren't used to it yet, you got to train them up, then goats would be perfect to come through there first. Right. right. Or goats and cattle together, right? Yeah, okay. Goats and cattle together would work okay. very well. You can run cattle and goats or cattle and sheep together pretty well right. and they'll do a good job uh, you know but you don't want to run pigs with cattle and chickens with cattle all right so I would come through here you know cattle and or sheep or goats then I would move chickens behind them about four to five days behind the cows now why 
there. Exactly. That's a way to break the parasite cycle, both the fly larvae and the worm larvae, mm -hmm. right? So the chickens are gonna come through here and now those eggs have hatched and you got larvae in there and those chickens are, you know, scratching through those manure pads and they're eating all that larvae and they're breaking that internal and external parasite cycle. So the timing at which you move them behind them is really important to help break those parasite cycles. And then I'll move the pigs in a day or two behind the chickens. Now, what are the pigs doing for them? Okay, they're just further in that process, aren't they? And they're taking those manure pats and spreading them on out. And then they biologically decompose really quickly. So I've got that incorporated back as new organic matter into my soil. And now I've got a multi-species operation humming across the land. And our rule of thumb, I didn't say it this morning, I was remiss, I meant to, but on our farms now, our rule of thumb, you know, somehow over the last seven decades in agriculture, we got ourselves trapped in the mindset that we can only produce one crop per acre annual, right? Why did we ever come up with that? Why did we ever think that? You know, that has doomed us to decades of economic failure in agriculture. This monoculture crop, only one crop per acre per year, and that's all we can do. Our goal on every one of our farms now is to produce a minimum of six different revenue streams every acre every year. Every acre, every year. Even our woods, okay? So say I'm running cattle and sheep and goats and pigs and all of that through these woods, and we're growing mushrooms and we're growing ginseng, and we're harvesting timber, and we got hunting income. See where I'm going, guys? Okay, so now I've got multiple revenue streams. If it's an open acre, I've got multiple revenue streams. If it's a wooded acre, I've got multiple revenue streams. Now, a lot of our producers today have done what with their woods? Fenced them out, right? My gosh, that's an incredible resource. You know, we, we need to be having, because Again, that's why our woods are so thick and choked today. And by the way, they don't support near the wildlife like that that they do when they're open and savanna like. You'll have far more deer, far more ground nesting birds and everything else when you have those wood, that wood are much more open than thick and choked like that. That, that really limits your wildlife and your, your, your ecological biodiversity. So I want to open it back up the same way that the bison and the antelope and the elk and the deer did when they were here in large numbers. I want to open that woodland back up. You want to be able to see through all the woodland, guys. That, that's, that's when it's ideal. So how do we protect our livestock from predators? Particularly in the woods. Yep, so we use, we use a handful of things. Number one, we use guard dogs, okay? What breed? Uh, well, we're using a number of breeds. We use uh, Great Pyrenees, we use uh, Commodores, uh, and a couple of other breeds of large dog, you know, that are, that are uh, you know, long time guard dog bred, uh, that guard sheep, goats, that kind of thing. They, they guard our chickens, you know, so we keep the dogs with our chickens as well. So the dogs are very, very good at keeping out all the shark tooths. Shark tooths would be you know, your foxes, your coyotes, your bobcats, raccoons, things like that. And as I said this morning, they also do a good job of protecting from the raptors, from the hawks and eagles and so forth. So guard dogs are great. We also use alpacas, okay? Now alpacas will not protect from the raptors, so we don't use them with chickens. So the alpacas will, anything on four legs, it looks like a canine in any shape, form, or fashion, an alpaca will slam run off, okay? And if they catch it, they'll kill it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so alpacas are great guard animals. And the beautiful thing about an alpaca is that they eat what all my other grazing animals eat. I don't have to feed them separately like I do a dog, right? Yeah. So they just live with them and I don't even have to worry about them at all. So I love alpacas and that kind of situation as well. You know, you can, at times you can use donkeys as well, uh, but sometimes donkeys, they'll either work or they won't. Yeah. You know, they, they, they're sort of a selfish type animal. And, uh, 
and they care more about themselves than anybody else. So, so again, there's a market for everything, guys, and everything matters and everything adds up through the year, right? So we've confined and constrained ourselves to thinking one acre can only produce one thing in any given year. So these are just some things to think about.